Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about applying these ideas of inference to what we already know about regression. Alright, so we know that when we have a data set, we're taking a sample, that, that sample is one of many samples that we could have potentially got. All right, and we've applied these ideas, these basic ideas of inference, confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, right? This idea of a, a sample and then generalizing about the population. All right, and it's the same thing actually with regression. Okay, so when we're doing least squares, simple linear regression, our equation looks like this, right? But this the samples that we calculate this equation with is one of many we could have potentially gotten. So that equation is one of many we could have potentially calculated. So really, that entire equation is an estimate of the true regression parameters. Right? With a little bit of error built in there. We know that error are called our residuals. Right? And we're going under the assumption that these residuals are normally distributed. Let's think about breaking down this formula into its pieces. All right. So actually, each piece of that regression equation right, represents a, a statistic that we are using to estimate a parameter. Right. So for example, that B0 piece, lowercase b, is actually estimating the true y-intercept for the population, or beta naught, the slope that slope we calculated from the sample is estimating the true sample slope. Right? The y that we predict is actually a representation of the true mean response. Right? And in fact, the correlation coefficient that we've been talking about is also a, an estimate of the true population correlation coefficient. Okay, so we're kind of thinking about all these things that we've calculated before for regression. We're now thinking about them from an inference angle. All right, so I think this is a pretty cool picture that kind of represents how we can think about it. Each of those pieces of that formula have its own distribution. Right, therefore, and we, and we already know, right, so say, say this is normal. We know a linear combination of two normal random variables right, is itself normal. Okay, so we still have these underlying assumptions specifically that we've got good sampling techniques and that we have a linear relationship. Right? We know that inference techniques always come with assumptions. All right, we also, so those, these two things aren't new. Right? We always want good sampling and we, all, we know that these methods only apply to linear relationships. Right? But something new to think about here, we have to be able to assume that the standard deviation of y is the same across the board for all values of x. Right? We can check this with what's called a residual plot. Okay, so we'll look at those. We know what residuals are, we haven't seen their plots yet. All right, and we also need to check that y is normally distributed. All right, so again, using that idea that a linear combination of two normal random variables is also itself normal, right? Then that implies normality of beta naught and beta one. All right, so what's a residual plot? How do we check those? We know how to calculate our residual, right? but now we have this new assumption that residuals should be normally distributed. All right. If our residuals are normally distributed, they should look something like this, right? where our residuals are nice and spread out evenly. There doesn't appear to be any sort of pattern. Okay, note this residual plot has the raw residuals right here. Okay, the actual numbers on the y-axis. Right. Other examples of residual plots we may see might use the standardized residual. Standardized residuals are, are a little bit more useful in most cases. Alright, so what are we looking for in residual plots? We want to see them randomly scattered. 
Now here's an example of a really great looking residual plot. Right, we see these are all randomly scattered, and we also see, so here it, they're all between negative 2 and 2. Right? It doesn't always have to be perfect between negative and 2 and 2 like this, but we know anything outside of two standard deviations is kind of unusual. So this is an example of like your perfect residual plot there. Nothing unusual, everything looks randomly scattered. All right, but here's what we don't want to see in residual plots. We don't want to see any kind of systematic deviation. All right, so we know a residual of zero there in the middle would mean no difference in what we observe and what we expect. All right, if we see some sort of systematic deviation, specifically here a curved pattern, what that's telling us is that we do not have a linear relationship. Okay, so that's not good. These things only work for linear relationship. Right, the other thing we don't want to see is something like this, right? Where we kind of see this, what's, what some people call like a, a funnel pattern, right? We don't want to see that because what that's telling me is for smaller values of x, I have small variance, but as x is getting bigger, my variance, my variation variability is getting bigger, all right? So we don't want to see that. And you can think about the reverse pattern here, right, where if I had a bunch of variation and then less variation as x got smaller, same idea, right, but we don't want to see our variability changing as x is changing. Okay, so the first here is what we're looking for, no apparent pattern. The second two graphs here, it's what we don't want to see. All right, so how do we apply these inference techniques? So our residual plot helps us check our assumptions. How do we apply these techniques? All right, well, we need to know about sampling distribution of these parameters and specifically their standard errors. All right, well, your overall regression standard error uses these residuals. You calculate your regression standard error like this. Take those, it's essentially the, the standard deviation of those residuals. All right, we square them, we add them up, and then note we divide by n minus 2, so we're working with n minus 2 residual or error degrees of freedom. All right, but that's usually denoted as s in the, in the regression context. Okay, so usually our, the parameter that we're really interested in, our, our y-intercept, not always so interesting. Right? Usually the parameter that's most interesting is our slope. All right, your slope, or B1, is, a, is an estimate of beta 1. All right, so we need to know what is its sampling distribution in order to perform inference. We're going to want to do maybe some hypothesis tests, maybe calculate an interval for beta 1. But we need to know about its sampling distribution. All right, well, it follows a T distribution with N minus 2 degrees of freedom, and its standard error looks like this. Now, note this is our regression standard error that we saw in the previous step here. All right, so the slope has a t distribution. It's an estimate of beta 1. So beta 1 is at the center of its sampling distribution. And we saw what its standard error is there, n minus 2 degrees of freedom. All right, so using this information, we know what a confidence interval looks like. And with this sampling distribution, then my confidence interval should look like this. Easy enough. Right? If I want to estimate the true value of the population slope. Okay, another thing I may want to do, hypothesis test for significance of the slope. All right, this is this is a very useful test, right? Because we may get a sample that gives us some sort of slope, right? But is that slope actually useful? Is that slope actually significant? All right, so for a slope to be significant, it could be either significantly positive or significantly negative. Right? But usually we're going to check the null if we're looking for the slope to be significant. Right? The null is going to be that it is not, or in other words, that the slope is zero. A slope of zero would, be, would not be useful. All right, so that's going to be our null, that the slope is zero. And usually we're going to do a two-sided alternative, that it's there is a significant slope. 
You can check for a significantly positive slope. You can also check for a significantly negative slope if you wanted to with a left or right tailed test. All right, we know what a test statistic looks like. All right, so I'll be observing values of B1, my value of beta 1, right? Typically this is going to be typically this is going to be 0, right? Over the standard error. Now another test that might be interesting to us is do we have a significant correlation? All right, but remember how the slope was calculated. That slope is, is directly related to R, right? To calculate the slope, one way of doing that, multiply R by the ratio of the standard deviation of Y and X. Since they have this relationship, right? One, something that's happening with one usually implies same things happening with the other, right? So that hypothesis test that we just talked about, testing for a significant slope, it's the same as testing for a significant correlation. All right, so we don't have to run separate tests here. We know if the slope is significant, our correlation is significant, and vice versa. All right, okay, so let's talk some more intervals with regression. All right, so remember when we were predicting values, that's using that, that line, that equation, plugging in a value of x to predict a value of y. Okay, lots of times your computer output and the output that we saw actually gave us two types of interval. Number one, it gave us a confidence interval, which we are familiar with, but it also gives us what's called a prediction interval. So if you'll remember when we were working with that baseball example, we had our regression equation here. We said, well, how long do we predict a game to be if we use eight pitchers? And we predict it to be about three hours long. Okay, so the output gives us a confidence interval. We're pretty pretty um, familiar with the, the interpretation, the explanation of confidence intervals. What about a prediction interval? Well, they use two different standard errors. So what's the big difference here? Prediction interval, we've got this in our standard error. That's going to result in a larger standard error. We notice our prediction interval here is much, much larger. Right? Our prediction interval is much larger than the confidence interval. Right? A confidence interval predicts the mean response. If we were to do this an infinite amount of times, what would the mean y value be? A prediction interval is trying to predict okay, in the next iteration of this process, right? Or if I were to go out today and play a baseball game with eight pitchers, how long could I expect it to be, right? So this is predicting a single instance versus predicting the mean response. Predicting a single in instance is going to be much, much harder. So therefore, our standard error is bigger and our interval is much, much bigger. Okay. The last part that's involved with the regression is what's called our ANOVA table. Right? ANOVA tables have uses in other contexts, right? but here we're going to talk about our ANOVA table for regression. Right? So you may have noticed on some regression output, you get a table that says something along these lines. Right? We've got degrees of freedom, SS stands for sum of squares, MS mean squared, F, that's our test statistic here. So let's kind of go through this column by column and see what we're working with. Now, whenever we're calculating this ANOVA table, and it is doable, but it's not something that we are going to spend too much time on. Usually this is the kind of thing, let the computer do the math, do the dirty work. But where it does come from are these things called sums of squares. All right, so here's where it starts. So. I need to have my sum of x and y, the sum of x squared, sum of y squared, and the sum of the product of x and y in order to come up with our sum of squares. Now again, remember this is for just two variables here. So we have two variables, that means three different combinations of sum of squares, xx, yy, and xy. All right, so these sum of squares are where all of these calculations start. Now you can do this yourself and you can kind of confirm the numbers. 
But again, we're not so interested in that. We just want to know where all these pieces of this ANOVA table comes from. So the easiest place probably to start in this ANOVA table is, let's go left to right, start with our degrees of freedom. All right, so your degrees of freedom, we, so our different rows here, we have model, we have error, right? We know that means error or residual, and we have our total. Okay, so your model degrees of freedom has to do with how many parameters am I estimating in my equation? Well, in our case, for simple linear regression, we're looking at y is equal to the intercept plus the slope times x. So we've got one, two parameters that we're estimating for simple linear regression. Total degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Now, on an ANOVA table, your model row plus your error row are always going to add up to your total row. Okay? So my, in other words, if I find my total, I find my model, my error will be the total minus the model. All right, ends up in simple linear regression. Your total, this is n minus 1. Your degrees of freedom, number of estimated parameters, 2 minus 1. n1 minus 1, that gives me n minus 2. All right, remember we saw that before for our degrees of freedom for residuals. So again, I'm putting this in the context of simple linear. All right, let's keep moving on our table. So our sum of squares, your SSM or your sum of squares model, your sum of SSE, your sum of squares error, your SST, sum of squares total. Easiest one to find is probably your sum of squares total. That's just equal to SSYY. Your sum of squares model involves the slope. You square the slope and multiply by your sum of squares over x. From there, the easiest way to do this is just use these equalities to find the error and take the total minus the model, kind of like we did with degrees of freedom. All right, next column, your mean squared. Okay, your mean squared is found by simply taking the sum of squares and dividing by your degrees of freedom. All right, so my mean squared model, sum of squared model over degrees of freedom model, my mean squared error, sum of squared error over degrees of freedom error. All right, then finally, we get to the test statistic column. Okay, to calculate this test statistic, we take the ratio of the mean squared. We also see something unique here, All right? So far, we've seen Z. We've seen T test statistics. Here, this is an F test statistic. All right, an F test statistic is a different distribution that we've used before. Something interesting about the F distribution, remember this it's a ratio of these two, mean squared. Each of these have different degrees of freedom. The F distribution uses two degrees of freedom, numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom. Okay, so when is this useful to us? Well, in simple linear regression, we saw that we could do a test, a t-test, right, to see if our slope is significant. And in simple linear with just one variable, right, your t-test and your f-test should match up. They should be the same when finding p-values. All right, but when we, if, if you move into multiple regression, Right, you may have multiple coefficients. Now you can run multiple t-tests to see if each coefficient specifically is significant. Right, but this f-test tells us about the overall significance of our model. Okay, so these t-tests tell you about specific significance of certain parameters. The f tells me about overall significance of my model. All right, so some other sort of side notes on things we can do with the ANOVA table. You can calculate your slope from these sums of squares. Right? Then you can calculate your y-intercept like we've seen before. You also actually can calculate r squared from your uh, 
your SS model and the ratio of your SS model and the SS total. All right, so that's all the basics that we have to talk about with inference for regression here. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see some more about this in an exam.